Thank you very much. Well, one moment. Because that question was specifically for um, that specific candidate, do you have another question that you'd like to ask the rest of the, you'd like the, rest of the panel to answer that specific question? Okay. Debbie, thank you for that question. I think growing neighborhoods out of poverty is a major issue, particularly in Ward 7, since uh, east of the river, uh, unemployment rate is the highest in the District of Columbia. I've been in all of the neighborhoods in Ward 7. There's not a neighborhood that I've not been in. I've preached in many of the churches in these neighborhoods. I'm not afraid to come across the river from Ward 1. A lot of my friends are in this neighborhood. And the issues that most of the individuals are concerned about are education, employment, and affordable housing. And I believe that we can work with those issues. And as I said earlier, giving somebody a job at Costco or, or at Walmart is not a way to bring them out of poverty. That's a way to keep them in poverty. We need to train them. We need to make sure that UDC becomes open enrollment school again so that our students, can, so that our young people and residents of the district can get an education because I believe that education is what's going to bring us out of the poverty situation that we find ourselves in. I have uh, campaigned in all the neighborhoods, and especially uh, east, east of the river. And I would, first of all, need to set the record straight. Uh, Ward 7 does not have the highest unemployment. Ward 8 has 35% unemployment. Ward 7 has 20% unemployment. And to say that 35,000 people are unemployed in this city and that they don't need uh, jobs is just unbelievable <laughs> to me. I mean, Costco pays something like $12, $13, $13 an hour. Now clearly there's a problem with Walmart and that's the reason why they're in negotiations for a community ben benefit agreement. But people are hurting. There are people that, that need that $13 an hour job. And so we need the right kind of understanding that time. Because if, if, if our people don't get these jobs, the problem is people in Maryland, people in Virginia are getting these jobs on our dime. And when they come from Maryland, Virginia, they don't get taxed here because they're not D.C. residents. At the end of the day, it's about circulating that dollar in our community. And to say, and to say that we don't think you know, the Board of Education should do what they do, they have no power. So let's be real about really the special things in this department. To be clear, Deborah, your question was, which neighborhoods have we been campaigning in during this campaign correctly? And what are we hearing there? In Ward 7. In Ward 7, yes, okay, sure. So, so let's be truthful, I've been in several neighborhoods, I can't name them all, but it, you know, for example, I've been in Marshall Heights, Benning Ridge, River Terrace, Hillcrest, and several other neighborhoods in Ward 7. And what I've been hearing in Ward 7, consistently, that people want to see great schools and better education for not just their own children, but for all the children they see in the community. Because this has been a chronic problem. When I grew up in the city, I went to Woodrow Wilson High School in Ward 3 with residents of Ward 7 who had to travel across the city to find an Eastern High School to go to. And that's something that people in Ward 7 don't want to continue to have to do or subject their children to. They want to have a community that is safe. They don't want to feel like they're constantly victims of either, either young people or people in their community that are preying upon them. And they want to know that the economic development in Ward 7 will happen, and happen quickly, soon, so that there will be those jobs, but that there will also be the basic services so when we choose to go out to breakfast or lunch, we can go somewhere beyond Denny's to meet each other. Okay, we'll have our next question from Sam Ford. Sam. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Tracy. I see Tracy out on the streets as we're traveling around the city doing the news. So good morning, Sam. It's good to see her. Um, I guess I'm going to ask about Mr. Shapiro as well. Uh, he mentioned uh, construction jobs, and, and he said that, you know, that I guess they're kind of temporary. Of course, my father was a construction worker, and they knew you know, the job runs out, and then you got to go somewhere else, and you got to find a job there. But at least you have the skill. And I think one of the, the concerns is, to what degree, first off, I'd like to ask everyone here, to what degree do you think that the city is in fact uh, enforcing these agreements that they make with these construction companies that come into Washington? I know a bunch of ministers had a march uh, last week about it. And the question is, to what degree do you think they're doing this? And if you don't think they're doing it to the degree they should, what are you going to do to make sure that this happens so that more DC residents can actually work at these jobs. Um, I don't know the word. 
We can start, why don't we continue doing it this way? You can go ahead first, that's fine, thank you. Thank you, Madam President. Just to be clear, the question is, are we enforcing the laws uh, that help local residents get the jobs and, the and the agreements, and if we're not, what can we do about it, right? Let me put this very briefly in a bit of a national context, which is, uh, there's an organization called Good Jobs First that rates what Washington, D.C., rates what every state does and Washington, D.C., when it comes to holding folks accountable for the kind of economic development incentives that we, that we offer. And, and whether we hold the folks accountable for delivering what we ask them to deliver. We are the worst in the country when it comes to this. We are 51 out of 51 when it comes to setting standards and holding companies accountable to those standards. So the short answer is we are not doing enough. The first thing we need to do is enforce the laws. We also need stronger community benefits agreements, and we need to make sure we are training folks so that folks are going to be qualified for the jobs that are being offered. It's a leadership issue. The vision isn't there. To what degree do you think the city is enforcing the jobs? I don't think the city is enforcing the jobs at all. We have what is called DC residential preference. But I believe that the preference is going to Virginia and Maryland residents. I live in Ward 1, and I look at all the construction jobs around, and all the tags I see are from Virginia and Maryland, and generally people that uh, don't live in the district. And I understand that their jobs are temporary, construction jobs are temporary, but I think it's better to have a temporary job than not, not to have a job at all. But what do we do when those temporary jobs are over? I think we need to increase the preference. I think we need to make sure that the law is clearer about the number of DC residents. We need to raise the number of DC residents. It should be 70, 30 instead of whatever the number it is now that our individuals, and even training them. Uh, UDC has a community college now. The electricians make good money. Uh, plumbers make good money. We need to train our individuals. But I'm here to say that there are individuals in the district, in Ward 7 particularly, who are already trained that are not getting the jobs. When I was on the council before, I ascertained that our law was not being followed. We were only spending $98 million in, with our local small business community. I called in every single agency head told them that this is what the law says. 50% of your budget must be spent on local small disadvantaged businesses. The spending went up from $98 million to $567 million. When you sent me back down to the council nine months ago, I immediately held that hearing again. We ascertained that this government shortchanged our business community $400 million in 2011, $180 million in 2010. The bottom line is we are not enforcing those laws, but it's up to your politicians to stand up with courage. I had to fight the administration just to hold the hearing. Remember, I'm the one that got the law passed for the living wage back in 2006. I had to come back now in order to get it implemented. We just passed the law now to call these developers in on the carpet. And to say that a construction job is not a good job is ludicrous. We got construction east of the river, southwest waterfront, $700 million project downtown, another uh, project all over the city. Construction jobs are here. So people don't have it. So I think it's pretty clear that we're not doing a wholly ineffective job of enforcing the agreement. And, and in part because we allow developers and other construction companies to sit in front of us and say, well, we just can't find the skilled people to do these jobs. And we let them tell it over and over and over again. We've gone through a stadium, we've gone through school modernization, multiple other projects in the city, and it doesn't take a rocket scientist to say, okay, if you're telling me today, for some reason you don't believe we have the residents available to do the job, then what are we gonna do so that three, four, five years from now, we don't have this conversation again? But that hasn't been done. It hasn't been done by generations of political leaders who've had lots of rhetoric, but have not delivered on the promise of getting residents skilled and ready for the jobs, and then holding these contractors accountable to employing DC residents. And so if you're going to get the job done, you've got to hold people's feet to the fire, and stop throwing rhetoric around about what you will do, and actually <laughs> get it done. Thank you, next question, Bruce. Thank you. Um, I think it was Mr. Biddle who said at the outset that uh, District of Columbia leaders are distracted right now, and I suspect that that per 